All right. So this is another classic jazz standard. Of course, this is uh, the Disney standard. Someday my prince will come. And this is a favorite of jazz musicians. A lot of guitar players especially love to play this song. Of course, Jim Hall loved to play this, and he even wrote um, a different melody on these changes. Um, so let's take a look at this. Uh, this also, in, in the first eight measures of the song, we're going to try something new, which is basically establishing new texture. So far, up till now, with, the, with all of these etudes, we've been really looking at and focusing on walking four bass lines with little chord jabs here and there. And, um, you know, we have certain devices that we, you can uh, use, such as, you know, creating this resting motion using static chords, pedal tones, moving voicings. Um, but now we're taking this one concept and, and really spreading it out over eight bars. And I encourage you to do that um, not only in 4-4, four, four, but especially in 3-4, where you just might need a different texture to a song. So I, I just really want to emphasize the point that even when playing this style, it doesn't always have to be a moving bass line with these chord jabs. In this case, we're taking a rhythmic figure, and um, there's a lot of sustained uh, energy in these chord voicings. So we're basically taking one chord and spreading it out over the entire measure uh, for three beats. And that will, that, if you we were playing with a melodic instrument right now, whether they were taking a solo or just playing the melody, that will give them kind of this nice, you know, blanket uh, to spread out on, you know. Um, and it's, it will give you a pattern that, that uh, incorporates the thumb and the fingers, but in a new way. So basically, the rhythm is this. So if we to do it in time, one and two, three and one and two. And that's nice because it's rhythmic, it's in time, it's setting the tempo, but it's not quite a driving jazz while, you know, it's not a... It's not anything that, you know, in your face. Uh, it's, a, it's much more subtle. And the physical pattern behind it is also consistent. So basically what we have is a four-note chord voicing that's set in motion first by the thumb, and then the index finger just plays uh, a single note on the D string usually in most cases, um, and then the ring and middle fingers will uh, pluck the next two notes together. So it's almost kind of like, it's, it's not quite arpeggiating the chord, but it's breaking it up in an interesting way. So instead of just going, we're just sort of spreading it out a little bit. Thumb, index, middle ring. And we're just going to continue that physical and rhythmic pattern uh, for the first seven measures. So... Now we're using a root five chord structure, meaning the root of the chord is on the fifth string, the A string, but the pattern is still the same. You just need to get your thumb up to the A string, and then that will be consistent for the E flat major seven, and then for the G7 sharp five, the thumb moves back down to the low sixth string, back up to root five for the C minor nine, stay there for the diminished. Stay there for the sus. Now we're at the last measure of this particular phrase. So like we've done with our other etudes, we're going to do something a little different to break it up to signal the oncoming of a new section. So now we have um, a very common rhythm that's used uh, in jazz waltzes. Uh, in the bass, they're dotted quarter rhythms. Okay? So if we have three beats, one, two, three, one. It's kind of splitting the measure in half with a dotted quarter note. So you're hitting on the and of two. One and two and three and one and two and three and one, two, three, one, two, three, one and two and three and one and two. So if you do a lot of that, um, you know, if you do that in successive bars, it creates almost kind of like a four over three feel, which is really nice. Uh, and then we're just, you know, we're just going to uh, copy that with our chords. Starting in measure nine, now we're going to go into much more of a jazz waltz feel by making these chords short and staccato and, and much more of like a one, two, three type of feel. So listen to the contrast. I'll just play from measure five into measure nine and you can, you can feel the, the change. It's 
so we've gone to a different place in the song, and we're going to reflect that with our accompaniment. And that, that measure eight kind of sets it up using those dotted quarter rhythms. Um, it's, it's kind of like a bridge between this real floaty, suspended type of feel leading up to that. Now we're establishing some time and some rhythm, and then that will get us there. So by the time we get into the, the waltz, you know, the hard three feeling in uh, measure nine, it won't feel as abrupt or jarring. It's just kind of like a smooth bridge into that. Now, copy that. So everything that we're doing up to that point is basically the same as what we've been looking at in the previous etudes, except now we're in three instead of four. Uh, so we're just basically, you know, truncating each measure by one beat. We see the uh, we see a bass chord uh, bass triplet figure at the end of measure fifteen, um, and that is uh, on the C minor seventh chord, getting into the uh, F seven using a chromatic approach. So th this one's slightly different from the examples we've seen before, in that the bass line is actually moving. So if you wanted to just keep that chord voicing uh, the same, that would be fine. So basically, what we're doing is playing a C minor nine. <laughs> with a G in the bass. So again, we're just using this bass claw or, or bass chord bass, thumb claw thumb motion. But you can also move the bass line a little bit. The middle finger is playing the bass line and it's no problem at all to just move down one fret to capture that G flat, will, which will approach uh, the F7 chromatically and sound really nice. So that whole move is... The whole measure would be th one, two, three. It's just a nice little effect that you can add. Um, and again, you can either use two downstrokes with the bass or a downstroke followed by an upstroke in the bass, which is what I usually find myself doing just because it's practical to get to the next note. All right, moving into the second part of the song. Um, we have a slightly different chord voicing for the D7 chord in the, in the second measure. We're looking at measure 18 now. Um, we start with the same changes as before, B flat major 9. And then we move up to this D7. Now we're going to use the augmented chord, which is the original chord symbol that you'll see in this lead sheet. But um, I just want to mention that altered chords can also be used interchangeably with this chord. So usually we'll see like a D plus 7 or a D7 sharp 5. But you could also use an altered chord, such as in the first chorus, we used a D7 sharp 9. That, that purple haze voicing will work anywhere, just about. Uh, and in this case, in measure 18, we're using a flat 9 voicing, so D7 flat 9, which then moves into the E flat major 9. So again, we're creating a little melody uh, in those, those three chord voicings. The D7 sharp 5 has a D in the top into an E flat. E flat with an F on the top. So we have this nice little melodic line, which of course is a, is a big part of the melody. Um, so, so notice to buy my left hand some time to change chord fingerings, uh, change the fingering of the chord voicings in measure two there, measure 18, I've just slipped in that open A string to allow my hand to get off this and get into this, which would lead into the major nine. Okay, then after that, um, we're dropping in a couple of other chord voicings there, G7 over D, chromatic approach D flat nine to C minor nine. Now, this is a technique that you may want to try for the, to, in terms of fingering the G7 over D. Um, this is a technique that uses the tip of your middle finger, your second finger on the fretting hand, to fret two notes. And that's exactly how I'm fingering that one particular chord. I'm fingering it 2-2, two, two, and then the B with the first finger, and then the F with the pinky. So that's, some, that's a technique that you may want to explore. It comes in real handy when you play kind of a larger five or six note voicing to be able to play two different strings with one finger, in this case, the middle finger. Um, and if you, don't, uh, you know, if you don't nail that G on the D string every time, it's okay. If you just play that fragment with this um, you know, middle finger only grabbing the D, it's totally cool. Um, the, the sound of the chord will be conveyed just fine. 
And then uh, we're moving up the neck in measure 22 for a G in an inversion. And this is an example of where inversions would sound really nice. Of course, you could just stick with a standard G7 there. But it sounds really nice to have something else in the bass. So we're playing the same chord, G, with a B in the bass, and now G7 with a D in the bass. It's just kind of approaches the C from both sides. Then for the last section of the song, um, we're just using a, a real strong, you know, straight ahead, forward, moving three with our chord jabs both on and off the beat. So from 25... So in that particular four-bar phrase, we're using almost every permutation that we've taken a look at so far. On the beat, with the bass, off the beat, right after the bass, on, in, in, you know, on the end of the one, on the end of the four, on the end of the two, the end of the three. Also two eighth notes right on top of the beat like we see in measure 27. And then a sustaining bass note uh, at the end of measure 28, just hanging out in that low E. Then in measure 29, um, this is kind of a signature of this song, this B flat over F. So we just will play a simple B flat triad in root position over F. So it's kind of like we're hinting at, we're getting ready to resolve to the one, but not yet. Uh, and that's where putting this in second inversion comes in handy. I think it's also nice to break it up rhythmically by having a delayed attack in the bass. It's just kind of a nice little figure. If we're going to have this triad right on the beat in measure 29... It's kind of nice to answer that with some syncopation in the bass. That way they're kind of flip-flopping. They're, they're, they're passing the syncopation back and forth. We're used to hearing the syncopation in the chord line with this, you know, continuum of bass. So once in a while it's nice to have, you know, the continuum or the sustained part, um, the non-rhythmic part in the upper chord voicing and then have some syncopated bass. Um, you know, when you're playing solo guitar or playing this style, it's really important to just mix it up in however, you know, in as many ways as that you can think of just to keep it interesting. Um, so that's what we're doing in this case. We're syncopating the bass. And then the very end of the song is a little tag that you can use. Um, this is another tag that features constant structure. Um, we're using uh, basically major seven voicings in different intervals. So this is a real common kind of turnaround. Uh, some people even call this the Bill Evans turnaround, where you start with a tonic, go up a minor third, go to the flat six or down a fifth, and then go to the flat two before you resolve down a half step. And when you play those all using major seventh chords, that's a really nice turnaround that Bill Evans would favor quite a bit. Uh, so in terms of voicings, we can use a lot of the same voicings. So B flat major seven, connect that up to a D flat major seven. It's just a really nice sound. Um, now I could continue up to G flat to keep the constant structure of the voicing together. But in this case, I wanted to keep the register uh, lower. So I just went from this D-flat major down to this G-flat major 13 voicing. And that works because there's voice leading involved. There's not a lot of motion in the chord there, so it, it connects pretty smoothly. D-flat. And notice also I'm keeping the motion moving. I'm keeping it moving forward by using a quarter note on beat three of the bass. So it's not just hanging there. It's still moving forward. And uh, in terms of the pitch, you, you can use those uh, notes on beat three to connect into your next note. So for example, measure 33, the B flat uses a C to connect up to the D flat. And then an A flat on beat three, which will connect into the G flat. B flat connecting into the B, and then we're finally home with a B flat. So that phrase from 33 is. And then. And we're ending in the exact same way that we started with, both with the texture and the voicing. In the last four bars, we're kind of emulating um, this floating, sustained feel that we set up in the first seven bars. Um, so we can kind of, you know, hint at the beginning of the song, move full circle with our arrangement, and then close it out using the exact same voicing that we started with, which is a B flat major nine sharp 11. Mm -hmm. 